Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Andrew Henderson, who's founder of NomadCapitalist.com. He's also a best-selling author. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Andrew. It's my pleasure. Uh, you know, I've actually followed your work uh, and that of Nomad Capitalist for many years as I uh, myself internationalized and got three passports, lived in six countries and so forth. So it's a, a little disclaimer for people listening. It's great to have you as a Geopolitics and Empire sponsor and uh, urge urge yeah. people to check out nomadcapitalist.com and see how andrew can uh, help you and you know we've got a number of things in common i decided to permanently expatriate from the us in 2006 traveled the world ended up in mexico uh, and one of the many reasons was american empire culture and because i enjoy life abroad as well as this peace of mind that you speak of, Nomad Capitalist recently tweeted, quote, after years of traveling and reflection, our founder, Andrew Henderson, left the USA for good. The media talks about high taxes and financial reasons for leaving, but they miss the ultimate reason, peace of mind, uh, end quote. And so I know you've renounced US citizenship. And maybe if you just no. want to tell us a bit about, you know, what le led you to leave what I call the American empire. Well, that was um, <clears throat> five and a half years ago at this point that I renounced. And so... Um, Traveling and living overseas for a number of years, um, realizing, as we say, go where you're treated best. There's options for everything. You're not looking for one perfect place to move everything. You're looking for various places to move various things. And I realized on a personal level, I didn't want to be American. Um, I didn't want to be associated with that. Now, to some people, the accent still gives it away. Um, and I was I hosted a party last year in Vienna and somebody brought up kind of a geopolitics political issue and then immediately started lecturing me that I had no business talking about it because of my accent, even though they didn't realize I decided to cut ties with the U.S. for good. Um, if I want to go back, I have to ask their permission and they may very well not give it to me. So, you know, the common thing in the media is, oh, you just don't want to pay tax. Uh, the reality is I legally paid zero tax or in some cases, very little tax. For many years and i could have continued to largely do that um i found it offensive that they have all kinds of requirements for u.s citizens who live overseas that even though i didn't have much of a tax burden that you've still got to file a lot of forms it's daunting it's burdensome i'm a guy who likes to play by the rules i sleep better that way even if i don't agree with the rules and it was a lot of work i mean it, it was times it was pretty anxious but the reality is i mean ever since i was 15 years old i wanted to live overseas I never identified as a patriot. I guess briefly after 9-11, I kind of got on the patriotic bandwagon and then got off of it again because I just fundamentally think the U.S. government is is immoral, deceitful. I don't trust them. And there are governments around the world that, while not perfect, I'm in Ireland right now, they treat you like a human being. Their goal is to help. They are polite. Um, I found that in a number of countries, Malaysia as well, they treat you, they want you there. The U.S. says you should be happy that you have the chance to be there, and they've run the greatest marketing campaign of all time that's, that convinces most of the people there to say, oh, we've got the best. But they're the best in nothing, except for prisoners per capita, the highest in that. Um, I guess Mexico beat them in obesity. So now they're number two for obesity. The food is terrible. The food supply is bad. But I, you know, when you travel around the world and you meet people from Syria and from Yemen and from Serbia and from elsewhere that the U.S. came in and destroyed, sometimes you could say for not very good reasons. And you see the hurt that those people went through. You say to yourself, why do I want to be associated with this? I don't want to live in the country. Um. You know, we have some great clients from the U.S., but by and large, the people are pretty uninformed. They're pretty arrogant about being uninformed. Uh, the girls everywhere else that I was dating at a young age were a lot prettier and a lot nicer. And I just it just all came together, man. Like, what do I need this for? I would I would be embarrassed to show up in some countries and show a U.S. passport. I just don't want to be associated with it because I just realize there's a lot of nasty stuff there. And so whether it is Ireland or Malaysia or whatever else, but they just kind of leave people alone. I'd much rather be associated with that. Yeah. You know, the, the, the gist of what you're saying um, is kind of one of the reasons I left. I haven't gone as far to renounce my U S uh, uh, passport but, or citizenship and we'll, we'll see, but uh, j just yeah. along those lines to get more, a little more geopolitical and your thoughts on Pax Americana, American empire. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, 
declining. I've been looking at this for 20 years. One of the reasons I left because I foresaw in this decline, a lot of the things you you alluded to, we'd see economic decline, a cultural degeneration, uh, uh, and increased authoritarianism. Um, you know, before we started the interview, I was telling you how the DHS got me banned from uh, PayPal. And I'm like, uh, but I don't care about getting banned by PayPal, but it's just a shock as an American just to, I, I can't believe that, you know, we, we're actually crossing that uh, Rubicon. And so, no. and then, you know, we, we've got Ukraine, uh, Taiwan. And so, you know, these, these, the, these uh, forces, this uh, militar, mil- militarist uh, Americana is pushing for World War Three. Uh, they're very um, arrogant, as you mentioned, the citizens and, uh, you know, Washington, uh, the government, we've got the dollarization going on, which you frequently comment um, about on your YouTube. So just your, your, your further thoughts on the decline of the West, uh, the rise of the rest of the world, um, you know, wars and even domestically things are going nuts. You know, that we got these. Well, I, I haven't been there for a long time and I try to avoid going through there and I try to avoid even flying through there because it's just very unpleasant. Uh, I know a guy who got stopped just merely because he lives in Asia. He got flagged for being a child pornographer and they had to, you know, put him in a back room for a while while they checked all of his devices. Lo and behold, he is not a child pornographer and a he went on his merry way, but that's pretty crazy. That's what you do to your own citizens just because they choose to live somewhere else. Um, I work, you know, the industry of, of offshore tax planning and dual citizenship. And I'll be, I've been very clear. It's a pretty scummy industry in many ways. I mean, the reason that I started, you know, doing YouTube and using my real name uh, a decade ago was I thought the industry needed someone to be transparent because there's plenty of people who should know they have options. Um, So, with that being said, I have watched just in the last couple of days, a guy in our industry, listen, maybe he did something wrong, but oh, he was helping Russians move to Dubai. It sounds like there's a little bit more within that, but that was the gist of it. He's now banned, he's now sanctioned rather by OFAC, Uh, his entire company and people are adding me, they're looking for jobs and and it's probably going to be tough for me to, you know, work with any of those people. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything untoward. But I always wonder when you see these press releases, how bad really was it? We try and be so clean. Again, whether I agree with the rules or not, we're going to follow the rules and we're going to be do the right thing. But I do wonder how much sometimes there's a case when, you know, even the city manager of Hong Kong, um, all of her bank accounts got shut down. She was literally keeping cash in her apartment. She got a salary. It was piling up in cash. Because, oh, we don't like her. I saw a statistic the other day. 29% of the world economy is now under U.S. sanctions. And so you wonder, why are these organizations and countries and whatnot trying to get together and talk about what you call de-dollarization? Now, people misunderstand de-dollarization, I think. I don't believe it's the death of the U.S. dollar. People have been talking about that since the 60s and 70s. It's just going to go away. It's going to be the Weimar Republic. I think it's much more of an issue of things happen at the margins. Homeownership goes from 68 to 63 percent. You have a great recession. It didn't go to two percent, right? It's not like everyone didn't lose their home. A few people lost their homes, percentage wise. And look at what happened back in 07, 08, 09. And I think in the same way, you've crept up from the single digits of the world economy being under U.S. sanctions back, I guess, at the turn of the century, 29 percent. You can sit in your ivory tower in the United States, whether you're the government or whether you're the average citizen, and say, well, they must have done something wrong. And I say, according to who? Some of them are probably terrible people. Not all of them. 29% of the people in the world and the countries in the world are, are evil. And so, you know, the U.S., I think, has just gone beyond the pale to say, you know what? Screw it. We have enough people on our side that we can just do whatever we want. And it's like, well, wait a second. All these countries that don't care, I mean, I'm in Malaysia, they care about wars involving Muslims. If you're Serbian or Montenegrin, you still need a visa to go to Malaysia because of the war in the 90s. They, they're still not over it. They don't care about what's happening in Ukraine. Nobody cares about every war. And I, you know, we can, we can talk about those. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm saying there's plenty of countries where they're like, you know what, that's just not our business, what they do over there. And yet they say, well, why is it they don't have access to the world financial system or to hold U.S. dollars? Like, that's a little ridiculous. And you're seeing countries like Nigeria and Indonesia and India and, of course, China 
um, you know, coming up. And yet they're increasingly being shut out of the West. So what are they supposed to do? Just suffer and die? And I think that's what the U.S. does want them to do. I mean, Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon, says we emptied out the middle class in the West, in the U.S. to build one in Asia. Heaven forbid people in Asia should do anything more than live subsistence lifestyles and clutch for their their cup of rice every day. Heaven forbid a guy like me should be able to go and hire people in places like Serbia, like Malaysia, and take advantage of people who are a bit more affordable. Maybe maybe they want to work harder. And people in the U.S., they hate that so badly. And so you combine the fact that, it, you know, wages aren't going up as much. Why? Because people like me are hiring people all around the world. It's competitive. Um, you know, for all the people who are, it's a capitalist system, heaven forbid it would be competitive. And, and so they lash out. And then the other countries are like, listen, we've done nothing wrong. We're going to develop an alternative. And I think you're seeing that more strongly than ever. doesn't mean the dollar goes away. It means there's a little bit more competition. And, you know, you, so, you know, we're touching on the geopolitical, the economic uh, deterioration. And, uh, you know, these are some of the key themes that I touch on on the podcast. But, you know, one of the other themes that I uh, often you know, that I'm obsessed about is the technocracy. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the past couple of years, we've seen the World Economic Forum, the COVID stuff. And what one of my past guests, uh, Jewish historian Edwin Black, calls the algorithm ghetto or algorithm gulag. And just going forward, we're seeing many nations trying to advance these these digital controls, digital ID, digital passports that are just going to make life much harder, especially for thought uh, criminals. And, and it could be any number of things. You know, you question climate change. You don't want to wear a, a a mask or get get injected with what I call the Pentagon juice or uh, you're you're not on board with the official narrative of whatever war is going on and you'll be penalized. Yeah. Just, you know, a, a, any thoughts on this digitalization, uh, social, sort, sort of like social credit system or, or, or Davos yeah. and, and whatnot? Well, obviously a lot of crazy stuff has happened. And like you, I've been looking at this with my family since the mid-90s. And I've said, and my parents would talk about with me, how the U.S. and other Western countries are going to go in the wrong direction. And that's all proven true in the last quarter of a century. I do sometimes think as someone who's in the center of this, you know, we have millions of viewers on our YouTube. Um, I do think some people probably take it a little bit further than I'm comfortable with in terms of, you know, how they're restricting freedoms. But I mean, yeah, when they won't let you leave your country or even come back to your country, that's pretty scary. When they won't, uh, when they want it, when Justin Trudeau or Boris Johnson wants to threaten that, hey, maybe we're not even going to give you a passport to where you can't leave. Forget the pandemic. You just can't leave in general. That's pretty scary. Um, so I think you're seeing kind of some of the, the desperate clutches of people who maybe are starting to see that they don't quite have as much power. I mean, I, if you look at, um, the world's top 15 economies, Spain is up there. What the hell is Spain done to be the list? I mean, Spain should be like, a, they work like three to three hours a week over there. I mean, it's all about, you know, when they can take a break. I mean, you go to a bar, they don't even have wine. They didn't pay their bill. Ah, oh, what, what do you want from us at a bar? wine i mean how is that the only way spain is in the top anything of the world's economies is purely by default that the western world just held court over the entire world while everybody else rode bicycles um when we were kids the chinese were we would watch news and the chinese were riding bicycles now they're driving bmws and so countries like spain are no longer going to be as that important um and so i i, I just think the following there's always going to be a place to go. Now, people in the West feel uncomfortable and they want to tell me, well, that's just, you know, no, you know, to, to your thing. Some of the organizations you've mentioned, they're going to come in. It's going to be worldwide. Or they say this thing, as goes the U.S., so goes the world. I can tell you countless stories of people who live in Ecuador in a second tier city. Or I was talking to a guy who's got friends who live out in, uh, you know, Mozambique. And it's just kind of like everyone leaves you alone. I mean, even places like a Serbia. I mean, there's a lot of places in the world where the government doesn't want to be as heavy handed. The country's not as big. So like Mikhail Saakashvili, who was the president of Georgia, told me you have to be it's a hard thing being heavy handed because 
everyone knows everybody in these small countries, or they just don't want to, or they don't have the resources to. And so the idea that every country is going to emulate China or the US or whatever else, to me, I just is not true. And so what I tell people is if you want, if you're an American and you want to get your EU passport as you have through descent, um, or if you want to, you know, get, get an EU passport by, you know, through Malta, which will offer it to you for about a million dollars, or if you want to, you know, whatever, have that extra, what I call TRA passport, top tier passport as a backup. But you also might want to have residence or citizenship in a country um, that you that you would laugh at, Nicaragua or Vanuatu or some country in Africa. Obviously, you want to go about obtaining it legally, but find a place that is not on board with the current narrative. I am not um, one of these guys like, oh, I don't like the U.S., so I'm going to go side with Russia. But I do think it's a good thing that you're allowed to have a few places on Earth that don't share the Western narrative. And and again, I keep mentioning Serbia, but they're like, we're going to do our own thing. We don't want to follow the EU. Uh, we want to be our own country. We want to do what we do. We're, we're traditionalists, and we're going to to follow that. That might not be a bad place to go when some of this stuff happens. Uh, and so I just think that out of 196 countries and plenty more territories, like the Cayman Islands or you know whatever else, they're not their own country. There's going to be somewhere that you can go and having a diversified portfolio of wealth and access to these countries in and in, and to these countries is a good idea because I, I just think um, there's going to be places on earth where they don't roll out uh, stuff that's crazy. And you had people over the last couple of years that were saying, listen, I have millions of dollars, but I believe the com best combination of low tax and personal freedom is Nicaragua. You may disagree. I've been in Nicaragua. Um, most people who would argue with that probably haven't. Yeah, you know, and I, I was in uh, Croatia last year. I mean, you can go to rural Croatia. There's there's nobody yeah. there. It's a ghost ghost villages, which is you know one great option. Or you know, here rural Mexico, where I'm looking at, uh, some of my listeners are down with uh, Doug Casey and Matt Smith in rural uh, Paraguay. So you know, there's many places you can yeah. um, look to. And you mentioned uh, passports. You know, let's get into how uh, and where people can begin. Uh, you know, navigating all this stuff that's going on and building an international life raft, so to speak. You know, I was living mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan until twenty twenty. Uh, employed, technically employed by Nurslatan uh, Nazarbayev when when the, the the COVID hit, and I wanted to escape back to Mexico. It took us three attempts, uh, five days to get back to Mexico, and we had to go through Amsterdam, the EU, where normally third uh, country nationals were not allowed to go through. And yeah. because I had a Croatian passport, an EU passport, my family doesn't. They, they, they don't have a Croatian or EU passport, my wife and kid. And that allowed us, uh, you know, because they were my family and I was a citizen, to pass right. through Amst Amsterdam and get back to Mexico, where otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do that. So, uh, you know, we can talk passports. Uh, destinations you were listing some uh, as well as business or working internationally because i also some of my listeners consult with me or ask me about you know yeah. how can i work online I, I i also mentioned here in mexico i mean you can get employed uh, with good jobs with uh, mexican or international corporations that are here in mexico you can do stuff online real estate so you know walk us through you know maybe where to start uh for for people looking to um become an international man yeah i mean nomad capitalist service kind of our main holistic service is for folks who are making half a million dollars or more. Now we do offer a number of other services for everybody. Um, so, you know, I think the best way to get to that level is you're going to start your own location independent business or heck, I mean, a location dependent business where you are location independent, right? You have management in place, what have you. Um, from a tax planning standpoint, obviously something that you can take with you and run anywhere um, with the exception of certain royalty incomes like books or YouTube channels, that's you know a lot easier. And so if you can keep more of your own money, that's the first step to to building your freedom. Um, and so what we'll do sometimes is we'll help somebody who makes, let's say, half a million. They can save $175,000 in taxes, and they're going to put that first year of savings into creating their access plan, which is a second passport or a couple of second passports or a second residence that becomes a second passport and another second, you know, you can stack what are called residence permits, which allow you to live in the country, but are a little bit less secure because theoretically they can 
expire at some point, and then citizenships, which entitle you to get a passport. And so you're a citizen of Croatia, therefore they allow you to apply for a passport. And because Croatia is a member of the European Union, you could go and live with your entire family in any other European Union country, in Norway, in Switzerland. There's plenty that are tax-friendly, but it also gives the opportunity that if something crazy happened, and it was a country-by-country craziness, you would have other places to go to, kind of like an American could go from California to Texas. You could, for tax reasons, freedom reasons, have access to all those other countries. So maybe, you know, um, Bulgaria is not so crazy on this issue. Okay, you go live in Bulgaria. Um, You can move around. And so I think, you know, having passports gives you the best level of flexibility. You can, quote unquote, buy a passport in as little as six months. There's a handful of Caribbean countries that offer that. Some of them, if you were to live there, would be tax-free, which is a nice perk if you wanted to live there. Um, Those countries allow you to live in the other five um, Eastern Caribbean states. So you've got six different countries to choose from. Again, some have been more heavy-handed than others on certain issues, and so you have that flexibility. It's kind of six countries in one. Uh, Turkey has a program uh, where you buy real estate, you get a passport. Um, you know, a couple other countries like Vanuatu, you're basically putting out money generally as a donation, except for in Turkey. Uh, Malta in the European Union, 18 months, you can get a passport, but it's going to cost you about a million dollars. Now they're in the same position that you are as a Croatian. You want to go and live in Portugal? You want to live in Switzerland? Not in the EU, but part of the same uh, resident system. You can do that. And so I think that, if, you know, that's one way to do it. It's just, hey, I have money. I want to, to get access. If you have someone in your family tree, that's something that we help people do, um, and we'll help you collect the documents. I just spent nine years to put the final nail in the coffin that I am not entitled to Lithuanian citizenship. We had to go on a round-the-world search for various documents, and it turns out they left two years too early. Um, but if you have someone in the in your ancestry, parent, grandparent, great grandparent, you can often get citizenship as you did, not only in most European countries, but in some of the Latin American and Caribbean countries as well. Um, and that's generally free. It just takes someone like us maybe to help you collect documents and get the stamps and seals and put the case together. Um, and then, of course, you can do what you're doing, for example, living in Mexico. And after a certain number of years, you speak the language. Here's your citizenship through naturalization. I will make one other point. If you happen to be like French or Italian, those are countries where if you're married to someone, you don't even have to live in that country to get it. You can just register and then the clock starts ticking while you're not even living in France, for example. We've helped some couples where um, they both wanted to be French, but they didn't want to live in France and pay the high taxes. So uh, check your spouse, check your family tree, um, see if you want to move somewhere. And if you don't, then there are ways you can just buy access. Um, And I think that For me, I want to have a diversified portfolio of a couple of different passports. Maybe one's the US, maybe one's Western Europe, but one I would kind of prefer to be off the radar and a little bit weird. You know what I mean? Because it's nice to have a teeny little country you can go to where just, you know, they're not going to bother you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you you mentioned, uh, I've been thinking about even getting because i got three passports now which is, is pretty good and uh you know, my kid was going to be born in kazakhstan where i was living but they only allow one citizenship and even if my kid was born there they wouldn't that is, get they wouldn't get that is the issue by the way that is the so i'll tell you i know someone and i was not a part of this because i would not have a record i want to be on the record i was not part of this but i know someone who's in the u.s right now um i don't know them that well but i kind of heard through the grapevine they're going to give birth in the u.s they got a u.s visa they're going to the u.s they're going to give birth their child will be american does nothing for them by the way but the child will be american um met with someone today from canada yeah that happens people come to canada what people don't realize is mexico and most other latin american countries if you give birth there your child will be now if you give birth in brazil you can be a permanent resident if you live there for one to two years while it's processing you can eventually be a citizen now while you're living there you're gonna have to pay taxes in brazil so that's discussion of whether that's worth it for you but your child has it and then you can have it mexico you've got to wait two years speak spanish then you can apply that's faster than the rest of us uh we had some people that came to one of our events that gave birth to one of their children in costa rica they're now Costa Rican for life. What a great passport. They got like no military. They don't bother anybody. It's, you know, eco-friendly. It's fun. It's nice. I mean, it's maybe not my idea of a best place to live, but that's a kind of that's an idea of a cool passport where they're not bothering anybody. Nobody's angry at Costa Rica, right? And you've got a nice livable place you can go back to at some point. Plus, 
you've got access to other countries in Central America you can live in. So, um, you know, that's something that you can also do. Kazakhstan, they don't do that. Europe, they don't do that. So it's mostly an American thing. I think Pakistan has it, and I think Fiji has it. So if you're planning on giving birth, at least give your kid an extra passport. But um, yeah, people kind of think that just because you're born somewhere, that gives the kid citizenship. It does not in most places. Yeah, I was going to mention Kazakhstan, even if your kid was born there. No. Uh, they wouldn't no, get no. citizenship because you have no. to prove that you have a cultural or ethnic connection to Kazakhstan. And and I, I almost, I was going to take a trip to North Korea. I didn't for whatever reason. But it's interesting. Uh, Americans cannot go to right. North Korea on a U.S. passport. But if you have any other passport, you can go to check out uh, North Korea. And I was just going to say, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of maybe getting Guatemalan, you know, my southern neighbor here in Mexico, Guatemalan uh, residency. And, you know, it's nice to have these extra residencies as you uh, mentioned if I'm, you can't here's the issue with the u.s by the way i'm not sure if they don't try and find you like remember if you go to cuba and they find out remember the deal was like oh they're gonna like they're gonna fine you for like how dare you go to cuba i'm not i mean that's kind of a weird and by the way south korea does that they've got like 10 countries you're not allowed to go to so does israel so it's, they're not the only ones but isn't that kind of weird like well, you were born on our soil which i was talking to my canadian friend today i was born right across Lake Erie from Canada. So it's kind of just a freak accident almost that I'm American and not Canadian. I mean, if you, my parents would have gone for a boat ride that day, I might be Canadian. Uh, but they tell you like what you can do because you were born on their soil. They tell you what you have to do. I mean, and the U.S. is the worst at, okay, that's fine. I live on your turf. I play by your rules. But when I no longer live on your turf, what, what I still have to play by your rules? Oh, you don't like Cuba, so I can't go there? Yeah, you know, that's why I can go to Cuba on my Mexican passport. And, and as far as I can tell, you can go to North Korea without a problem, just not on a U.S. passport. I just, are, I, 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 I just don't know here. if they, under George W. Bush, they were finding people like if you were Mexican, if you were Mexican and American, and then you would come and they would find out somehow they would find you because because to them, they allow you to have other passports, but they don't to them. You're only American. They don't like you can't get arrested in the U.S. and call the Mexican embassy to come help you out. Like you're not a foreigner. So I, I, they really like they tolerate dual citizenship, but they they really think you're our property. Yeah, I, I guess I could go to North Korea, just not tweet about it. Uh, and you mentioned uh, portfolio earlier. You know, another question I guess is diversifying. We, you know, we've talked about passports, uh, maybe residencies. You know, I've got places where I can go in any of my three countries, and like even beyond. But um, you know, having bank accounts and stuff, I feel like it's getting harder. And harder. This is something that, that Casey as well has has touched upon yeah. that it's getting more difficult to be an international man. I used to have a gold oh, money man. gold money accounts. I had to shut it down because for two years, and I believed them in them early on. I've had Alistair McLeod of Gold Money on. I love his work. I'll, I'll still have him on. But James gold, Turk is nice. Yeah, yeah, James Turk and. But, you know, my experience was horrible because they kept pushing the KYC and they froze my account the first year for months and they asked an ungodly amount of of paperwork. I gave it. They unfroze the account. Then they did the same thing again the second year. And I'm like, I've had enough of this. And you're just seeing more and more of this sort of bureaucratic stuff. Going and here's forward. the thing. It's it's not even because of what they want. I mean, where where was I recently where they're like, yeah, we just do this because we have to satisfy the U.S. And if you want to transact in dollars, you have to satisfy the U.S. If you want to transact in euros, you've got to satisfy the EU. Um, and so, I mean, a, a country like Russia that says, all right, we don't care. Uh, we'll just run our own thing, whether you like that or not. Um, that's what you basically have to do if you want to not do that. So, I mean, people should know if you want to do this is why I think Nomad Capital as a business is a little bit underappreciated. People think that opening a bank account offshore is like going down to the Chase Bank and just like, hey, here's my 50 bucks. Here's my driver's license. And it's done in 20 minutes. I mean, they don't have the data on you. They can't pull up every record known to man on you to assert that you're a good person. So they've got to do their due diligence. But because of these big countries, it's so it's becoming much more difficult. We don't even really tell people that much anymore. Here's the bank to go to. We're like, here's a number of banks. And we think we can make a good number of them happen. But we've got to shop around a little bit with your particular you know, profile. Um, and listen, you know what, you know, they say it's like, why are certain things so worth it? Or, you know, wh why do certain things cost so much? Cause they're worth it. I mean, I, I think that, um, I don't know how I'm still alive having opened probably three dozen bank and brokerage accounts around the world and having all the residences and passports. It is laborious, man. But you know what? To your earlier question of what happens if this happens or what happens if that happens? I mean, during the pandemic, I was in Malaysia when it happened. 
it was tough for about five or six weeks. Then they opened up, even before Florida did. Um, then I left after a while. And I just kind of followed it to where I, I basically avoided most of the craziness because I had options. And I had permanent residence and I had citizenships and I was exempt from like, you know, certain, oh, you can't come in right now. And so I just kind of think that whatever they're going to throw at you, if you have enough options, you'll be covered. Um, and I just, th- I mean, and, and, and you don't need to get five or six or 10 passports, but having three strategically would be a good idea. Having money in a few corners of the world, you can do that if you're an American, you've got to report it. Um, having some gold somewhere else. I think the problem is most people don't realize the empire because there's their entire identity is based on living in the empire. And they think that like that makes them kind of like people from New York. If a New York sports team wins a lot, I grew up in Cleveland. They were always beating us, those New Yorkers. I wouldn't get so cocky that like you're, you're not Derek Jeter. Like, let's not like you didn't do anything. You just live in the city where Derek Jeter plays. And I think that that's the perspective these people take. Like, I'm from this great country. Like, it's like, don't take it so personally to you and don't think it'll last forever. Yeah, the exceptionalism is I was just in the U.S. and you 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 hear it, you smell it, you see it. It it it, it bugs me. And they do, uh, you know, they view I, people telling me to my face that Mexico is, you know, inferior and all these different countries are inferior. And I'm like, it's, by, the way, it's, by, by, by the way, not a thing in any other realm of life that the winner says. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. like, 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 like out of all the guys complaining about women and how, oh, it's so tough. Women is that, is that you know who I, you know, who the guys I know who are never complaining about women, the guys who are getting laid all the time. Because they figured out how to get along with women. They don't have to complain about them. The winners aren't the ones bashing everyone else. The losers are the ones bashing everyone else. The ones who failed to accomplish the thing they're talking about are the ones who are bitter about it. And they have to keep telling you about it. I mean, you know, if you're going around, hello, I make, you know, millions. Like, you're probably not. Yeah, no, that, that's a great uh, a point. And, you know, just to finish on that last thought, it, it, as you said, I mean, just having passports, a few accounts around the world. I mean, I can't tell you the last decade just uh, and I, you know, you I open you open up these accounts uh, ahead of time. You get your papers yeah. in order. And then when this stuff comes in, pandemics yeah. or wars or economic issues uh, or crime and you have to flee somewhere if you've got everything in order, it's just a snap. You can you can get through this stuff. And I can't tell you how many people in the U.S. Uh, or you know elsewhere that they haven't renewed their passports. I'm like, what are you uh, thinking? Oh, dude, I, I no, I was selling a property during the pandemic and uh, the buyer was in the U.S. He couldn't get his passport renewed for like nine months, which when you're buying property, you have to have like the passport number because it's not again, it's not a local transaction. We got so many calls. I mean, we had a sugar spike in 2021. Fortunately, I think as a business, we were able to learn from that and maintain a good chunk of that after all the chaos ended. But with crypto and with the pandemic, we had a sugar spike. And what was it? It was, oh my God, I just 10x'd my money. What do I do now? Um, well, we'll help you. But you know, you just waited a month to get started because we've got a long line. And, oh, you should have called me before you 10 x it because we could have saved you a lot more money. Or, oh, you want your passport now because you want to go. Like, yes, you have. And that's the fundamental challenge that you look at a lot of the countries around the world that people might, you know, discriminate against. People in those countries realize, hey, our place is not all that it's cracked up to be. This is not the be all and the end all. We should probably have some options. And I think that the challenge in the Western world, and particularly North America, is people wait until it's staring them right in the face. And it's like, you're not going to get citizenship next week. I mean, best case scenario, we get it for people in four or five months in the Caribbean. Um, you're not going to get it through your family tree that fast. Like, you got to put it, you have to be willing to say, listen, I'm taking out an insurance policy. And if you're willing to move overseas, you can pay for the insurance policy by lowering your taxes. But I'm going to spend some money on insurance to make sure when stuff hits the fan, whether it's financial, whether it's freedom, uh, whatever it may be, I'm covered. And, and just on the, the note, uh, just the, the third worldization in Mexico, you get your passport same day. In Croatia, you get it second day. Uh, yeah. And in America, our, our kid got, we had to wait five months 
for the renewal we're waiting months now from the u.s embassy it's absolutely and they uh, tell you how lucky you are to be no i have two passports where i've renewed them same day I talked to a friend in Malaysia recently. They got it. They went in in the afternoon. I had to go in the morning to get it in the afternoon. They went in after lunch and got it by the time they closed. So yeah, yeah. there's a difference in how countries care about their citizens. I will tell you, in the places where I spend time, by and large, the people realize, maybe because they have to or because they want to, who knows, but they just realize we have to actually be there. For, we're not running an empire. Even in a country like Norway, hey, okay, they got some crazy taxes, but you walk around, the prime minister, or the minister of the economy is just walking around on the street. I mean, it's a different vibe, right? I mean, you won't see Joe Biden walking around anywhere. Maybe he'll be like out sleepwalking or something. But I mean, it's just a different vibe. So if you're the United States, I mean, I've been in Georgia, you drive the street, oh, that's the former president going for a walk with his dog. Do you think a country like that has the has the the means, the mechanism to put in place as much of the craziness? No, they just they can't get away with it because they're not an empire. And I think the U.S. Uh, empire or U.S. is also making it harder for Americans to leave. And, uh, you know, just your thoughts on uh, and they're so shaming you. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, you, you were in one of your videos, you mentioned you were in Mexico, uh, not too long ago and you were talking about AMLO and how Mexico is safer, yeah. uh, than the U.S. Uh, I mean, I did for the first time in over a decade just yesterday have my car window smashed in. It was probably, uh, you know, a, a migrant because that's where they passed through where my car was. Uh, and so whatever, I just kind of like, we'll just replace it. We're getting it fixed today and that's just life. But, you know, the, the only time I stared down the barrel of a gun was in my hometown of Chicago about 20, uh, years ago. But just, you know, your, your thoughts on Mexico. Mex Mexico has become very popular. Um, the government seems to be, and I agree with you, like in your video, I don't agree with AMLO and everything, but he's doing a lot of interesting things and good things, trying to defend energy sovereignty, Mexican sovereignty. Oh, um, they've been screwed by the U.S. for so many years on on energy, um, where they've just been held over a, a barrel, I guess, is, is the, no pun intended. But here's the thing. If your window was broken in, in Chicago, most people wouldn't blame Chicago. They blame the guy. But then they go to Mexico. Ah, oh, that's fine. Right. Now we got you. That's proof. And so, uh, on a, on a, I guess if you look at homicide statistics, I mean, Mexico is higher than the U.S. Now, the U.S. is higher than a heck of a lot of other places. Um, and I think it's in the, it's in the bottom third of violent crime statistics to U.S. Um, you know, and so it's kind of funny. People don't want to move to Dubai or something because, you know, it's like there's zero murder. And Zubi was talking about this recently, by the way, on Twitter. Like, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, he said. Zero tax, zero crime. Just, I mean, and, and then people say, I don't want to go to Saudi Arabia. It's not safe. So people have, in many cases, they have the facts backwards. I think Mexico is a great country. I think that for Americans who are looking for a soft landing culturally, obviously not linguistically, but culturally, there are many similarities. I think Ireland is also a very good soft landing that can be tax friendly for foreigners, um, that linguistically is similar. You'll be understood. You'll be heard. People are nice. Those are two at the, high, at the heights of my list. In Malaysia, maybe two. Um, it's not that difficult to get residents in Mexico. Now, if you're going to live there, there's some tax planning to do, and are you going to get citizenship? But there's a number of factors to consider. But Mexico, while more difficult than it was, is still open for people to come there. And I just think that, and by the way, the Mexican passport is actually pretty darn good. There's only two countries of note that you can't go to as a Mexican that people would say, well, I kind of want to go there. One is Australia, and one is the United States. That's it. Now, if you're from the United States, that may be an issue. You can go to the United States as a Croatian. Uh, but if you weren't to be American. Um, but, I mean, people don't understand. Even Nicaragua has a pretty good passport. Guatemala, you mentioned, pretty good passport. Um, you may not, like, if you have to live in those countries and earn money, sure, that's not ideal. But if you are the a kind of guy like you or I... Um, now, I will say Nicaragua, the capital, was the only place I had a gun put in my face in my life. Um, so don't don't go to Managua, Nicaragua. There's other parts of Nicaragua that are nice. But uh, I just I, I think that people just don't know the statistics. I mean, we put up the Nomad Passport Index. The U.S. had like the 38th best passport this year. Not terrible, but hardly number one. And I think Mexico, um, from a passport perspective, from a living perspective, from a quality of food perspective, I mean, it's not perfect. But, you know, I have friends who live in Chicago and they live in the places where you don't get murdered. 
And if you live in Mexico, you'll live in the places where you don't get murdered also. Yeah, that's it. Those are uh, great points. And um, all right, if you got any final thoughts for us, I know you've got, a, I think, a conference coming up in Kuala Lumpur. I think I saw Zuby speaking. Yeah. I, I'm a fan of, yeah. of Zuby's. He was supposed to come on the podcast and then uh, he had a scheduling issue. I'll have to try to get him back on. And so conference, you got a book, you got the service. Yeah, great YouTube uh, stuff you're doing on YouTube and your your articles and then uh, the services you offer at nomadcapitalist.com. So final thoughts. And then if you want to let us know uh, yeah. about projects. Well, my 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 five magic words are go where you're treated best. And it's not go where you're treated a little better. Moving from California to Arizona is not really the answer anymore. It's still a move. If you're going to move, you might as well move. And you might as well look into the actual statistics, whether it's our passport index or freedom of speech index, freedom of the press index, economic freedom index, taxes, whatever, and realize that no matter where you're from, but especially from the United States, you're not, your country's not number one in anything. You may like it, and maybe your emotions override um, logic. And that's fine. Maybe you're willing to put up with a dwindling uh, place where you pay a lot of money to not get much in return because you want to go to grandma's every weekend. And I'm not going to judge you for that, but we should at least know the score and know that's why we're doing it and not because it's number one. So we put out a, a video every other day on YouTube, over 2,200 videos in total on second citizenship and taxes and everything else offshore, Nomad Capitalist. The book on Amazon is called Nomad Capitalist. Um, it's got over 2,000 great reviews. Um, it's more of a story that kind of educates you on what you can and what you can't do. It talks about some adventures, just gets you primed and ready. Uh, we are having the world's best gathering, in my opinion, of open-minded global citizens uh, every year, Nomad Capitalist Live. This year, it's in Kuala Lumpur in September 6th through 9th. Uh, it is not the cheapest event because nobody sponsors it. It's nothing but information and nothing but networking. Nobody can pay to, to sponsor it. You are the customer, not the product. And then the same thing applies to our service. Um, if you're not sure where you want to move for more for lower taxes, more freedom, uh, we offer one of the only agnostic services in the world that helps people. We've helped people move to 31 different tax-friendly countries, get 28 different citizenships. I mean, we don't have a dog in this fight. And so you'll pay for very agnostic advice that transcends tax, immigration, freedom, investing, all under one roof. And uh, if you want to go to Nicaragua for a month and get a gun shoved in your face, you'll be able to find lawyers in Nicaragua too. But you're not going to do that on Google. <laughs> I've tried and failed. That's why I had to go there. <laughs> That's why I send my team around to these places on a continual basis, because it is not the United States. They are not on Google in the same way. <laughs> Boots, boots on the ground is yep. uh, a key. And uh, uh, again, thank you for your work, uh, Andrew, for sponsoring Geopolitics and Empire. And again, as I've mentioned before, it's always a nice surprise for me. Uh, I've followed your work for, you know, probably, you know, for many years. So, it's you know, I and I don't take anyone as a sponsor. So people that I enjoy, you know, previously we had Mikhail Thorup of Expat Money, um, you know, Nomos Time Bank, uh, above uh, Ramiro Romani of uh, Above Phone. And so uh, all good, great uh, people doing great work. I'll include all your links in the description. And thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Glad to be with you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com. And I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find geopolitics and empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit and Twitter take down posts. And after the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. 
Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.